Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the beautifully restored Rosecliff, and as well as online. Hello, everyone online. A um, little housekeeping before we start. If you have not silenced your phones, please do so. Silence or turn off so we don't have any, any interruptions. And um, I would like to, first of all, to introduce myself. My name is Kate Pedersen, and I am the Education and Programs Manager here at the Preservation Society of Newport County. Um, we are very excited for tonight's lecture, The Celestial City, A Closer Look at Treasures Illuminating China's Contributions to Newport. Uh, but tonight is going to go a little bit differently than previously planned. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, uh, Dr. Nicole Williams, who is our wonderful curator of collections, um, is unable to be with us. And she sends her very deep apologies. And in her stead, I will be reading her notes um, for her portion of the lecture. So they're her words. They will just be coming out of my mouth. Um, so but I would, before we get started, I would still like to formally introduce her so that you get to know her a little bit if you have not met her already. Dr. Williams earned her bachelor's degree from Harvard College and her PhD from Yale University in the history of art with a specialization in American art. Her work as a scholar and curator focuses on the global context for 19th century American art, women's histories, intersections between art and law, and practices and theories of hand craftsmanship in the age of industry. Her research has been published in museum catalogs and scholarly journals, including Women's Art Journal, The Journal of Modern Craft, 19th Century Art Worldwide, Photography and Culture, and Panorama, Journal of the Association of Historians of American Art. Dr. Williams is the curator of the Celestial City, Newport and China, which opened September 1st right here at Rosecliff. So if you have not seen it, I do hope that you purchase a ticket to go uh, visit one of these weeks. The second portion of this evening's lecture will be delivered by Dr. Bing Huang, Assistant Professor of Art History at Providence College here in Rhode Island. Dr. Huang collaborated with Nikki Williams on this exhibition, and she earned her PhD from the History of Art and Architecture Department at Harvard University. Dr. Huang's research interests are broad and interdisciplinary, encompassing the confluence of Chinese and European artistic influences, the intricacies of Han Dynasty tombs and architecture, Buddhist art, and the evolving landscape of media and advanced technologies, including virtual reality, and artificial intelligence generative art. Dr. Huang collaborated with Nikki Williams on this exhibition, and they are both excited to share an insider's look at this new and groundbreaking exhibition. Uh, they will both, and me on behalf of uh, Dr. Williams, will share insights into dazzling artworks in the show that reveal the unsung contributions of Chinese and Chinese American individuals to life in Newport. It will include inspiring stories about the Chinese artists, merchants, immigrant entrepreneurs, and women suffragists who shaped the city's culture, economy, and politics. We will be holding a Q&A after the lecture tonight. Uh, we will have a stationary mic over off to your left, so please don't be shy. If you have a question, um, you can stand up after the lecture and go over to the line over there. And uh, Dr. Huang will be happy to take questions, and we will also take a note um, for when Dr. Williams can answer those questions as well. So now I switch over to Nikki's voice. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, Dr. Williams is very excited to share more about our new exhibition at the Preservation Society titled The Celestial City, Newport and China. The Celestial City brings together more than 100 spectacular works from the Preservation Society's collection and other institutions in a range of media, from paintings, sculptures, prints, and photographs, to fashion, ceramics, lacquerwares, and lanterns. These objects reveal China's deep influence on Newport from the 18th century through the Gilded Age. In this time, generations of Newporters look to China for knowledge, beauty, fortune, and freedom. In turn, many different people of Chinese heritage, including artists, merchants, immigrant entrepreneurs, and women suffragists, helped shape all aspects of life in Newport. Dr. Williams' main motivations for organizing the show 
were to uncover and celebrate their contribu contributions, many of which had gone unrecognized. A massive amount of original research went into unearthing such new narratives. But collaboration was equally essential. Many of the new stories uh, that she would like to share tonight surfaced as the result of countless conversations she had had with other scholars, contemporary artists, and with the descendants of courageous Chinese immigrants to this country. To capture this exciting dialogue happening behind the scenes, Dr. Williams decided to frame our galleries as a dialogue. So if you explore the galleries upstairs, you'll encounter the voices of different contributors. You'll find wall labels and a video interview that ring with the voices of young research fellows, artists, and descendants. And Dr. Williams hoped that this dialogic aspect of the show would welcome new voices and elevate multiple perspectives and will become a new model for future exhibitions here at the Preservation Society. It's an innovative curatorial approach that excites her because it's inclusive and empathetic. It really harnesses the power of personal connection to help bring the past to life. So now that we've shared a little bit behind the process behind the show, Nikki wanted to dive into the exhibition itself and explore some very special works that reveal the many contributions made by individuals of Chinese heritage to life in Newport. We can start in the first gallery titled The Lure of Trade, where we explore the flourishing trade that existed between Newport and China from the 1700s through the 1870s. By the mid-1700s, Newport was a bustling, coloni bustling colonial seaport connected to China through multiple trade networks. Although the British government forbade colonists from directly trading with China, Newporters obtained a range of goods through trade controlled by the English East India Company, as well as other legal and extra-legal means. Newport uh, Newporters especially prized tea, silk, and porcelains. Tea, silk, and porcelains were emblems of wealth and nobility in China. The plate on the right centers an elegant arrangement of decorated objects that refer to the pursuit of anti antiques connoisseurship among scholars in China. But Dr. Williams wanted to stress that Newporters who purchased these plates were probably unaware of such cultural meanings. That's because Newporters had only a rudimentary knowledge of Chinese culture. They tended to view Chinese exports through the filter of their own experiences. For example, this plate was owned by wealthy Newport merchant Godfrey Malbone, and he probably viewed its depiction of precious wares as a sign of his own wealth and cosmopolitan tastes. The plate's meaning shifted in some ways. It was hollowed out as the object became a Western commodity. Chinese merchants and artists excelled at pitching their products to the Western market, and one way they did, did that was by adopting Euro-American motifs. This plate and teacup here belonged to the Robinson family of Newport. They're decorated with European-style heraldry and monogrammed with R's standing for Robinson. Cantonese merchants fulfilled overseas orders for porcelain customized with such monograms and insignia. And Dr. Williams found that the merchant Yam, Sh Yam Shinkwa placed this advertisement for porcelains customized with regalia in a Rhode Island newspaper in 1804. That makes it the very earliest ad placed by a Chinese merchant in any American publication. It shows marketing savvy of Chinese merchants and the importance of the Rhode Island market. In Newport, 35% of local estates listed Chinese porcelains by the 1770s. A French chaplain stationed here observed, there is not a single person to be found who does not drink tea out of China cups and saucers. In the colonial per period and early republic, 
Newport's expert craftspeople sought inspiration from Chinese goods. This exceptional tall case clock was owned by the Stanton family of Newport. It works by local clockmaker William Claggett and a case that was probably Japaned in Boston. This term that I just used, Japaning, referred to a Western decorative painting technique that imitated the style of Asian lacquer. The word evolved to describe Western faux lacquer painting because Japanese lacquer wares were highly prized in Europe and the colonies, although most objects that actually inspired Japaning had been imported from China. We are extremely lucky to have on loan from the Winterthur Museum this tea table by Newport cabinet maker John Townsend. Notice the Chinese style fretwork or open carving all along the tabletop, stretchers, and brackets. Chinese style fretwork was a fashionable form of chinoiserie decoration in 18th century Newport. Such exotic looking ornament signaled the table's function which was to hold Chinese porcelains, Chinese teas, and other equipment for tea service. To signal how the table was used for tea, we placed on its top this exquisite mother of pearl tea caddy made in China. Look closer in the caddy's sinuous foliage designs because they're exactly the style of fretwork Townsend imitated on his Newport table. So far, we've explored how trade with China transformed the material world of the 18th century Newport. But it was really in the mid 19th century that Newporters trade with China took off. In the mid 19th century, local merchants like William Shepherd Wetmore, who you see on the left, made huge fortunes in China. They filled their houses with mementos of their travels that also announced their status in the city's competitive social world. William Shepherd Wetmore traded in China throughout the 1830s and 1840s, and then retired comfortably in Newport, where he built this stately villa called Chateau sur Mer. Chateau is now Preservation Society property, and we're lucky to have a few Chinese treasures original to the houses, to the house. One is this striking cigar box made from Wetmore in China. An inland landscape adorns the lid and scenes from daily life parade along the sides. You can see from this view that the box is enormous. Wetmore's box is about twice the size of other cigar boxes produced for Westerners in China. And we can interpret, and by we I mean Nikki, this highly unusual size as embodying the enormity of, Westerns, of Wetmore's fortune and the ambition of the craftsmen who made it. So what Nikki wanted to show next was some wonderful artworks collected in China by traders from the King family of Kingscote, another Preservation Society property. Multiple generations of the Kings were partners in Russell and Company, the most powerful American mercantile tra firm trading in China. They, collected, they, collected, they all collected uh, Chinese furniture, paintings, and other decorative wares which we show with the proviso that these luxuries were obtained with the family fortune made through heavy investment in the opium trade. Russell, Ru Russell and Company was a major dealer in opium which ravaged China's society and, econ and economy. And I think we've all become sensitive to this history as we grapple with the ongoing opioid pandemic, epidemic. One of the most captivating pieces from King's Coat is this panoramic painting of Canton, the most important treaty port in southern China. We see its bustling harbor and business area lined with foreign, foreign hongs. This piece is actually one of a pair of massive views of Canton that's long adorned the King's Coat Library. There the views created an immersive environment that simulated the travel experience. You can think of pictures as a kind of Victorian IMAX. They're totally immersive and transporting. The kings collected hundreds of small items as well, which we've gathered to preserve a sense of their densely packed arrangement at King's Coat. One item that's attracted special favor is this central uh, cavorting dragon. He's actually an incense clock. Um, 
But Dr. Williams' favorite piece from King's Coat is actually this tiny, easily overlooked basket made from twisted silver wire. Um, it was known as filigree, and Canton silversmiths excelled at filigree. They made most filigree for export to Southeast Asia, though Americans also collected small items. We know uh, this basket was purchased by William Henry King uh, because Dr. Williams found it listed in Williams' account book from China as one silver filigree card basket. And this description revealed something else that we had not known about the basket, which was that William probably used it as a card basket to receive calling cards um, to the visitors at King's Coat. So Dr. Williams was very excited to learn about the basket's use um, as, as a card receiver, but even more excited when she looked into the history of calling cards and discovered that the Victorian practice of leaving calling cards was invented in 15th century China. The last member of the King family in China, uh, David King, returned to Newport in 1874 at the start of the Gilded Age. And that's exactly um, where Dr. Williams picked up this story in the next gallery, which is devoted to the experience of Chinese immigrants in Gilded Age Newport. Um, here, Dr. Williams shared never before told stories from Newport's Gilded Age Chinese community. Um, by carefully com combing through archives and locating uh, interviewing descendants, we learned that more than 60 Chinese-owned businesses opened in Newport between 1876 and 1915. Hardworking Chinese immigrants had bustling businesses at central locations across the city on Thames Street and Broadway, Duke Street, and Spring Street. One especially inspiring story is that of Li Yun, who opened the laundry shop you see in these photos on Thames Street in 1890. The laundry only closed in 1942. It was open for more than 50 years. And that's an incredible uplifting example of Chinese entrepreneurial success. Dr. Williams will emphasize that Chinese migration to Newport is largely a story of success against the odds. It's a story of courage, ingenuity, and perseverance. Chinese residents faced great hardships, of course. We talk about the unjust immigration laws and racism in Newport that Chinese immigrants faced as they forged new lives. Chinese immigrants in Newport were targets for assaults, police raids, and property destruction, all of which Dr. Williams found reported in local newspapers. For example, laundry owner Sam Lee, who ran this shop on Broadway, was struck on the head by an angry customer armed with an earthen crock. But Chinese Newporters persevered. They built thriving businesses and transformed the city's culture. Another example are these early Chinese restaurants that introduced new flavors, ingredients, and cooking methods to Newport. Some early Chinese immigrants married and raised children here. And we were very lucky to find the descendants of one local family. Here you see Terence Lee at our recent exhibition opening. Terence is the grandson of a man named Gum Lee, one of Newport's earliest Chinese residents. Gum ran a busy laundry shop on Thames Street and was also a devoted family man. In a video feature that plays in the gallery, Terence graciously shares Gum's story with us, reflecting on how his grandfather persevered and paved the way for generations of his family. In this gallery, we also receive hidden connections between our venue, Rosecliff, and the Chinese American experience. Heiress Tessie Fair Ulrichs built this mansion, Rosecliff, with the wealth of her father, James Graham Fair, a Western railroad and mining magnate who employed many Chinese workers in the American West. Around 1850, thousands of Chinese men moved to the West drawn by the gold rush. Most were poor rural men, despite desperate to improve their lives. They found work building railroads, clearing land, and mining gold and silver. The Fair family fortune and Rosecliff itself were built on their hard work and determination. As violence and discrimination exploded out west, many Chinese men of west 
west of the, of the Rockies started to move east to cities like Newport. We found that the first Chinese business ever recorded in Newport was Wa Sing's Chinese California Laundry, opened at 198 Thames Street in 1876. Wa Sing likely came from California. This advertisement for his shop is an incredible document that marks the moment the Chinese diaspora was from the West Coast set roots in Newport. At the same time that Chinese immigrants were settling in Newport, Newport's new industrial elites were avidly collecting Chinese art and chinoiserie. Our third gallery gathers impressive works collected by Newport's Gilded Age elites. They spent lavishly to acquire antique Chinese art and chinoiserie objects that had adorned the great palaces and estates of Europe. For example, the large case pieces you see in this gallery were owned by Harold and Gertrude Vanderbilt, and they all had fancy European provenance. Through such acquisitions, Newporters announced themselves as the new American nobility to rival Europe's old aristocracy. You're looking at the lavish breakfast room at the Elms here, the summer mansion of coal magnate Edward Berwind. Around 1901, French decorator Jules Allard installed Chinese lacquer panels at the breakfast room, which he probably salvaged from a demol demolished Parisian townhouse. Allard provided an additional modern panel and chinoiserie furnishings to match. And we noticed surprising connections with Berwind's life as we studied the antique panels in depth. For example, this scene depicts the waterside mansion of a wealthy Chinese man on a warm summer's day, and it mirrored Berwin's own leisured life in his seaside summer palace, the Elms. And Dr. Williams wondered if Berwin recognized this parallel. We turn now to the last gallery in the show, which re-examines the Chinese tea house at Marble House, a crown jewel of the Preservation Society. In 1912, social leader and suffragist Alva Belmont commissioned architects Hunt and Hunt to build the tea house overlooking the sea at her Newport estate, Marble House. Alva opened the tea house for a major women's suffrage conference in 1914, and she continued to host suffrage meetings there until World War I. For a long time, the Chinese tea house was interpreted as an architectural folly inspired by the simple fact that chinoiserie decoration was in vogue at the time. And Dr. Williams thought there might be more to the story, so she started to take a deeper look along with the rest of the Preservation Society team, and they found connections between Alva's suffragism and Chinese history. What was found was an incredible story about how heroic Chinese and Chinese-American suffragists inspired Alva's political activism and the building of the tea house. In 1912, U.S. suffrage leaders heard rumors that Chinese women had won the right to vote in the newly formed Republic of China. American newspapers described how Chinese women had fought bravely in the revolution that overthrew China's last emperor and petitioned successfully for suffrage. The reports were somewhat overblown. Women had been enfranchised in one province only, and the government soon rescinded their right. Yet U.S. suffrage leaders were energized by the news. They reached out to Chinese women in their communities for advice on how to gain the vote and invited them to speak at meetings. This New York Times photograph from April 1912 shows Alva Belmont and her colleagues meeting with seven Chinese women suffragists at a seminal conference at the Pekin restaurant in Manhattan. Chinese-American student Mabel Pinghua Li is confidently addressing the crowd. To the right, Alva listens with rapt attention. You can just make out her profile rising from the sea of heads here. On May 4th, Chinese women also joined a great suffrage parade through New York City. Mabel led the way on horseback. You can see her at left in this newspaper montage. Alva Velma, the woman, is the woman standing here on the right. 
In this exhibition, we feature original designs for the Chinese Tea House alongside objects that honor Chinese American women's contributions to the suffrage movement. This drawing is one of four original watercolors, watercolor renderings of the Tea House by architects Hunt and Hunt that are on display. It's a generous loan from the Library of Congress. And here's a nearby display with writings and portraits of Mabel Lee and another inspirational Chinese American suffrage present at the Pekin restaurant named Grace Yip Tai Pond. The man you see on the left is Doug Chu. He's Grace Tai Pond's great grandson, and he lent a precious family heirloom uh, to the show, including this stunning portrait of Grace in a pose of strength mixed with elegant refinement. Doug also lent Grace's much-used teapot, which he affectionately calls Grandma Taipan's teapot. It was one of the most powerful objects in the exhibition because it exudes this familial love. Another special loan is this suffrage banner from the Huntington Library. It's never been exhibited before. The banner was carried in the 1912 suffrage parade by president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. The slogan, Catching Up With China, suggests that the US was behind, the China, was behind China on the issue of women's rights, while the banner's stunning blue-green color evoked Chinese jades and, calcedon, and celadon pottery. Dr. Williams wanted to conclude her talk by also showing you a magnificent contemporary artwork in the exhibit. Uh, this series of large scale lanterns was created by a Boston based artist, Yu Wen Wu. And um, it was made especially for the exhibit, The Celestial City. Yu Wen Wu's five lanterns illuminate, literally and figuratively, the themes of Chinese immigration to the American West and onto Newport which is the subject of her lantern at the top left here. Then moving clockwise down the spiral, the next lantern explores the trade in Chinese commodities that grew Newport's wealth. The third lantern honors Chinese entrepreneurship in Newport. And the fourth reflects the painful legacy of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, particularly um, that banned Chinese immigration to the US and also the ongoing anti-Asian hate and violence particularly in the wake of the COVID pandemic. And the last lantern at back left celebrates Chinese American contributions to the US women's suffrage movement. UN skillfully combined scenes of Chinese migration, labor, exclusion, protest, and community from Newport and across the US. Her lanterns weave together complex themes to honor Chinese contributions to Newport and the modern Chinese diaspora of Rhode Island. And in that sense, they, embody, they exemplify our mission for the show, which was to range widely to tell untold stories, reveal hidden histories, and honor the many ways that individuals of Chinese heritage shaped our city. And Dr. Williams is so grateful to all of you here for supporting such new directions for our research and exhibitions. And she thanks you again for attending tonight. Now, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Bing Huang to the stage. Thank you everyone for attending today's talk. It has been an honor to contribute my expertise to this exhibition. Above all, the cherished friendship I've developed with Nikki through this journey. Our exhibition unfolds against a backdrop of timeless lore that cradles the essence of US and China. And on a grander scale, the dialogue between the West and East. This fascination deeply rooted in history is most vividly manifested in art and artifacts meticulously crafted and fervently amassed over the centuries. This dance of mutual fascination stretching across time forms the narrative of our exhibition. I believe many of you in this audience have already seen this exhibition. As you venture upstairs to see the exhibition, you will see this long hallway and you will be greeted by two oil portraits of the Chinese Hong merchant, Wu Bingjian. 
The portrait to the left is estimated to date back to around 1840. It was gifted to William Henry King by the merchants of Russell and Company upon his retirement in 1849. William Henry King bought King's Coat in 1864. A landmark of the Gothic Revival style um, in American architecture. The King family retained ownership until 1972, at which, portrait, um, at which point the final de descendant bequeathed it to the Preservation Society of Newport County. This piece on the right was acquired from China by William Henry King's elder brother, Edward King, in 1844, and is attributed to George Chinnery, Edward King, the pioneer among the King brothers in China, shared a deep friendship with Wu Bingjian. While numerous variations of the portrait here on the left exist, this is the sole rendition depicting Wu Bingjian in full length um, without a cross-legged stance. The portrait on the left is a piece created by the Cantonese studio of Lan Kua, Chinese name, Guan Chaochang, in emulation of the style of Lan Kua's mentor here, George Chinnery, an English painter who spent most of his life in China. Wu Bingjian, whose life spanned from 1769 till 1843, was arguably the wealthiest man on earth in the 19th century. His investment of a staggering half a million dollars to American railroads in collaboration with John Maury Forbes Coupled with his decision to delegate the management of all his overseas investments to foreign acquaintances, underscores a degree of reciprocal trust that transcends conventional expectations. Yet, despite his stature, he found himself, much like many of today's Chinese business tycoons, at the mercy of, forced, uh, of forces beyond his control. Government drained business um, commercial profits, viewing merchants as a wellspring of wealth to be tapped through fines sometimes fabricated. After almost single-handedly paying the fines to the British following the Opium War in 1842, he also lost his Guangzhou trade monopoly. Reflecting on this, he wrote to his friend Robert Forbes, if I were young now, I would seriously consider taking a ship to America and settling somewhere near you. Thomas Allen, an English painter, depicted China with romantic and mystical undertones in this print, the dinner party at the Mandarin's house. Such gatherings were common as Hong merchants often hosted foreigners in their elegant country estates surrounded by gardens. These Hong merchants were an elite group, granted exclusive trading rights with Westerners since the 16th century. Wu Bingjian's initial focus was on aligning with the influential British traders, especially the British East Indian Company, to strengthen their commercial stance. However, with the advent of American traders in Canton, Ho Kwa, um, the nickname of Wu Bingjian, saw an opportunity to diversify his trade partnerships. Presented here is a rare letter written from Wu Bingjian, probably by his um, penman. This letter states that the British are taking American vessels and goes on to make a request for the process of the cargo of the leader be remitted to Ho Kwa's agents, um, James and T.H. Perkins in Boston. One of the American entities Wu Bingjian engaged with was Perkins & Co., through which he channeled his business, highlighting a willingness to establish trading relations with American entities as early as the first decade of the 19th century. This was in contrast to some other Chinese merchants like Mu Kwa, who declined American business. American traders found Wu Bingjian to be a dependable and honorable business partner Traits that bonded well um, and boded well for establishing long tra uh, term trading relations. The language barrier was a significant challenge in 
Wu Bingjian dealings with American traders. Unlike the British East India Company, which had linguistic skills among its staff for conducting business with the Chinese, Americans lacked such infrastructure. However, Wu Bingjian's moderate proficiency in fusion English、um, allowed him to communicate with English-speaking traders to some extent. A specific instance exemplifying Wu Bingjian's business dealings with American involves Brian Ives from Rhode Island, with transactions dating back to 1801. The business was about procuring cargo of significant value, reflecting the growing financial interactions between Wu Bingjian and American traders. Moreover. Wu Bingjian maintained bilingual records of his transactions、uh, with American traders, including、uh, indicating a cautious approach to ensure clarity and minimize conflicts in financial dealings. His practices, like using functional notations in Chinese alongside his English signature in receipts, were a measure to ensure clarity and accountability. In transactions, Robert Bennett Forbes, an American partner who collaborated with Wu Bingjian over many years, observed that Wu Bingjian possessed no proficiency in reading or writing English, apart from his signature. Displayed here is a unique cash payment receipt adorned with the trading signature of Wu Bingjian,、uh, known as Hou Kuai. The name Hou Kuai represents a romanization of his business name, Hou Guan, derived from his native Hokkien language. This receipt is dated December twenty eighth, eighteen eleven, from Canton, and is complemented by a corresponding translation in Chinese calligraphy. The confidential nature of his work in commerce, as well as in political dealings with foreigners, required that he have some trusted friends among his foreign partners. Robert Bennett Fob says, "I quote: It resulted from this state of things that his foreign correspondence and his political negotiations were laid before some American friend who read, explained." And under his direction, answered all his letters. Another artwork I would like to discuss today is a self-portrait sculpture、um, by an eminent American sculptor, Gertrude、um, Wh- Vanderbilt Whitney, founder of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney grew up in New York City, but spent her summers in Newport at the family summer home, the Breakers. I believe many of you may have seen this room in the Breakers where she used to stay. She modeled herself as a Chinese Buddhist deity、um, and named the sculpture Chinoise, French for Chinese woman. This piece is the original plaster sculpture,、um, from which a limestone and two bronze versions were later crafted. The limestone variant is at the Whitney Museum of American Art's permanent collection in New York City. The self-portrait blends Art Nouveau with Chinese Buddhist sculptural elements. The fashionable bob cut of her hair is contemporary of its time. Yet in this 1913 portrayal, she embodies a Buddhist deity. Her closed eyes and tranquil smile suggesting a rise above worldly matters. In this curated image of the exhibit, we present a juxtaposition of two sculptures. This bronze sculpture of Guan Yin is emblematic of the inspiration behind Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's adjacent Chinoise、um, piece. The sculpture of Gertrude draws from iconography commonly linked with figures such as Maitreya, Shakyamuni, Amitabha, and Dipankara. As evident, I'm setting her alongside two Buddhist statues for comparison. She mimics the same mudra, posture, and drapery akin to the statue on her right. This statue, known as the Apaya Mudra,、um, so this gesture.、Um, 
symbolizes reassurance and protection. Notably, her stance on the lotus petal mirrors the one displayed on the side um, on the side of the slide at the left. Further, her attire resembles the Buddhist monk robe, reminiscent of drapery, often associated with figures like Guan and Shakyamuni. Another interesting thing to notice is that Gertrude is wearing a, Mar a Mary Jane type of shoes, uh, in contrast to the majority of Buddhist sculptures, which typically depict figures as barefoot. While it may not be a direct inference on Gertrude, the manner in which sculpted her drapery evokes echoes of Gandhara sculptures. Gandhara sculptures represent a distinguished genre that blossomed between 100 BCE and 700 CE amidst the culturally eclectic and religiously inclusive environment of the ancient Gandhara, situated in the northwestern expanse of the bygone Indian subcontinent. The sculpture oeuvre from this era, manifesting primarily in reliefs and freestanding works emblematic of Buddhist devotion, is esteemed for its syncretic syncretic essence harmoniously melding stylistic imprints of Hellenistic, Persian, and Kushan aesthetics. Gandhara sculptures um, holds a special place for pioneering anthropomorphic portrayals of the Buddha, Buddhasattvas, and related entities. While Gertrude likely draw inspiration uh, from East Asian Buddhist sculptures, her Western education imbues her work with echoes of earlier Gandhara art. The drapery of the Buddhist monastic robe in her sculpture evokes the finesse of the classical and Hellenistic period of Greece. Although Gertrude named the sculpture Chinoise rather than Guan Yin, the sculpture has evoked a dichotomy of reactions from its audience. A segment of the audience lauds its avant-garde interpretation, perceiving it as a homage to Buddhist traditions. In stark contrast, some contend that Gertrude's portrayal, through the appropriation of Buddhist iconography, veers towards the presumptuous, subtly suggesting a lofty self-equivalent to the esteemed Buddhist deity. In Gertrude's defense, it is not uncommon for artistic endeavor to, for artists to infuse their self-portraits with divine undertones, melding personal identity with ethereal attributes in a refined manner. A quintessential example is Albrecht Dürer's um, renowned self-portrait from 1500 which bears striking parallels to preceding depictions of Christ. One cannot overlook its alignment with the conventions of religious paintings, the meticulous symmetry, the profound dark tonalities, and the poignant manner in which Durer engages the viewer. Positioning his hands at his chest's midpoint, I would also like to join your, um, draw your attention uh, so to Another artwork I think I will highlight today is this garden sea from Chateau Sumer, a French phrase that translates to castle by the sea, owned by Wetmore family. This garden sea encapsulates various episodes from the Chinese drama, The Tale of the Western Chamber. In Chinese, it's called Xi Xiangji. Before we delve deeper into the story and intricacies of the Garden Sea, I'd like to acknowledge Danny, who saw this Garden Sea before I did and identified it as depicting the romance of the Western Chamber, or Xi Xiangji. My own deep research on the topic, which um, is manifested in this um, Hover print I studied before also is on the topic of Xi Xiangji, uh, aligns with her identification. Upon closer inspection, um, you will notice that the seat's hexagonal design, um, with each of its six facets representing a distinct scene from this tail. It's noteworthy that the top of this ceramic seat was once adorned with an additional or two additional scenes. However, 
the consistent use and the weight of those who rested upon it have led to the fading of the upper enamel, attesting to its frequent use. The obscure design atop the seat has been a source of great curiosity and slight frustration for both Danny and myself. Our journey to uncover this mystery took an unexpected turn during an exhibition opening at the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston Seaport. We were there at the invitation of Yu Wen Wu, uh, whose very lantern um, is at the uh, exhibition you see upstairs. It was at this event that we had the pleasure of meeting Gabriel New, the curator of Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. To our delight, Gabriel revealed that their museum housed a counterpart of our seat. Their version, fortunately, remains in impeccable uh, condition. This discovery offers us, at last, a complete view of design that was hidden from us. The story of the Western Chamber stands as one of the most celebrated Chinese drama crafted by the Yuan Dynasty playwright Wang Shifu. Set against the backdrop of the Tang Dynasty, the narrative delves into the clandestine romance between Zhang Shen, a young scholar whose name translates to the student Zhang, and Cui Ying, the daughter of a prominent minister from the Tang Dynasty. Over the centuries, artists have employed diverse and innovative methods to depict the tale of the Western Chamber. Throughout my presentation today, I will re reference paintings and prints from the Ming and Qing dynasties to illustrate this story for you. The narrative starts at Pujiu Temple a Buddhist monastery where Ying and her mother take respite. They lodge there both to mourn and to pray for Ying's late father as they transported his coffin to the ancestor's, ancestor home. As women of high nobility, it was customary for them to seek refuge in temples, benefiting from the added privacy and tranquility these sanctuaries provided. Notably, Ying Ying celebrated for her beauty, also found a sanctuary at a temple from local bandits drawn, drawn to her allure. On the other hand, Zhang Shen was a scholar from a modest family um, who aspired to become a scholar official in the government. He was making a stop on his way to the capital to take the civil service examination. Once he passed the exam, Zhang Shen could acquire a position in either a local bureau or at the central court, um, gradually rising in status. This was common goal for every scholar in Imperial China. But at the moment, Zhang Shen was taking a pit stop on the way to visit a childhood friend, General Du Chue, who was stationed not far away. As General Du Chue had mentioned the renowned scenery at the Pujiu Temple, Zhang Shen went to pay a visit. As it happened, Zhang Shen was blessed with more than great scenery during his stay. It was love at first sight when he encountered Ying Ying for the first time within the temple grounds accompanied by her servant. However, Zhang Shen was prevented from expressing his feelings as Ying Ying was under her mother's watchful eye. I'd like to draw your attention to this print. Uh, it's called Ming Qiji print from the Cologne that captures the pivotal moment within the confines of a fishbowl. Zhang Shen was able to read poems as he lingered on the outer wall for her, uh, of her chamber. Despondent, he let his feelings flow ceaselessly and was eventually reciprocated by Ying Ying on the other side of the wall. Soon the flying tiger, a local bandit whom Ying Ying was avoiding, soon dispatched bandits to surround the monastery in an effort to abduct her. Ying Ying was in a vulnerable position as, his fa as her father just passed away and there were only several ladies accompanying her on the journey. Distraught, Ying Ying's mother agreed that whoever drove the bandits away could have Ying Ying's hand in marriage Seeing this opportunity, Zhang Shen contacted his friend, General Du Chue, whom successfully subdued the bandits. In this Ming Qiji print, um, 
the act is masterfully portrayed within the lantern reminiscent of a carousel. This design vividly conveys, conveys the dynamic movement of General Dutri's army. Just as it seemed that Zhang Shen and Cui Ying were set to be married, Ying's mother expressed reservations about her earlier pledge to Zhang Shen. The Cui family had a long-standing tradition of not welcoming commoners. She then revealed that Ying Ying was already promised to the son of a distinguished official. The two young lovers um, was greatly disappointed and pined away in their unrequited love. Fortunately, Ying's maid, Hong Niang, um, initially was sent by Ying's mother to spy on her daughter, took pity on the couple, and served as a messenger to arrange secret uh, uh, unions between the two. Nowadays, the term Hong Niang refers to matchmaker and to help facilitate the pursuit of romantic relationships. Ying's mother thus suspected that Ying might have had an inappropriate relationship with Zhang Shen. Consequently, she called Hong Niang to interrogate her. Left with no choice, Hong Niang told the truth. Hong Niang pleaded with the Ying Ying's um, mother and on behalf of Ying and Zhang Shen. When Ying's mother discovered what her daughter had done, she reluctantly consented to a formal marriage on one condition. Zhang Shen must travel to the capital and pass the civil examination. In this scene, Zhang Shen departs for the capital to undertake the examination, leading to a heartfelt farewell. To the joy of the young lovers, Zhang Shen proves to be a brilliant scholar and was quickly appointed to high offices. The story ends on happy notes as the two were finally married. I'd like to underscore that the practice of amalgamating diverse episodes into a singular artwork emerged as a distinctive innovation in 18th century China. As evident in this print to the left, from which I have drawn several sections to illustrate the story to you so far, similarly, a finely crafted vase at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London beautifully displays 24 episodes from the narrative on its exterior. The last piece I'd like to talk about today is this exquisite trio of lacquer tables, emblematic of the craftsmanship characteristic of the 19th century Chinese export era. This piece is from King's Gold. You can see the monogrammed DK here, stands for David King, one of the King brothers who went to China. These tables, believed to originate from Guangzhou, carry the intricate design inferences of the 19th century English stack, stackable nesting chairs and tables. Specifically crafted for the export market, they epitomize the nuanced aesthetics and profound cultural exchange that define the pivotal um, era in Sino-Western interactions. This attention to detail becomes apparent in the pierced and support uh, with the, the splayed legs um, ending with gilded cloud toes. The table surface command attention with their hand, uh, hand scroll shaped illustrations. The vibrancy, res res uh, the vi their vibrancy resonating with the um, spirited dynamism found in the renowned Chinese long hand scroll painting, Qingming Shanghe Tu, along the river during the Qingming festival and its subsequent, subsequent renditions. The tabletop depicts a two, a three dimensional visualization of this kind of long hand scroll with a portion open and the rest folded. The parts looks like the end of a hand scroll uh, with a rod in it. The depicted scene bears a resemblance to the painting showcased on the right. 
presenting just a fragment of the entirety as well. The original artwork stretches for several meters long. Um, the subtle indication of scroll here at the corner suggests a continuation beyond the visible segment, hinting at a longer narrative, much like the painting itself. To end, I would like to say that this exhibition showcased a plethora of Chinese objects collected by Americans during the Gilded Age, encompassing a wide array of artifacts and photographs from the Shinwazu rooms of these mansions, as well as Chinese tea houses uh, located at the Marble House. Notably, the phenomenon of Shinwazri rooms extends beyond Newport. They can be discovered in Miami's Villa Vizcaya, and are a recurring feature in many European palaces and gardens, a tradition with origins tracing back to the 18th century. The enduring fascination with China prompts a critical inquiry. Is this curiosity about the other rooted in genuine admiration, or does it reflect a sensationalist interest in the strange or shocking? Or perhaps a complex interplay of both, Perhaps they harbor an appreciation for the bucolic and picturesque landscape and interesting and intricate gardening traditions of China. For instance, the French dubbed the term Jardin Angru Chinois, a wry nod to English gardens' admiration for Chinese aesthetics. In tandem, this enduring fascination with China prompts um, us also to look at um, the, the, di the very different um, narrative, um, the divergent views of China by the French uh, Enlightenment philosophers, Voltaire and uh, uh, Montesquieu. So Voltaire lauded the Chinese empire as a vast family and championed it as a global model. And in contrast, Montesquieu depicted China as a despotic estate, uh, a state ruled by fear. Yet the very sketches and drawings of, the, uh, of China made by, for example, the Marconi embassy to China, um, such as that of the William Alexanders, inspired artists such as Thomas Allen, So um, the Marconi Embassy was the first British embassy um, to China in 1793. And William Alexander's drawings um, inspired the romantic chinoiserie motifs that later adorned palaces such as the Royal Pavilion at Brighton uh, in England, commissioned by King George IV. Perhaps viewing China as um, the antipode, a locus of presumed difference, illuminates the self, contributing to the formation of self-awareness and self-satisfaction. The works we show today prompt us to reflect on the intricate web of perceptions, motivations, and interactions, and the ever-evolving narrative of global exchange. I hope you will enjoy this show as much as we put it together. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Wong, and congratulations on the exhibition. You and Dr. Williams have done such a fantastic job. Thank you. We'd like to invite anyone with a question to come up and ask, and I'm actually gonna start off this evening. Um, I'm sure in your collaboration with Dr. Williams, you had to make a lot of really difficult decisions about what to include and what to cut in the exhibition. If you could add in one more object or one more story from your research, what would you be really excited to add? That's a very interesting question because um, if, if I can add anything, it's, it's usually like there's a lot of logistic involving adding like if you can gather a loan from another um, collector or another museum. I think there are several objects uh, we wanted to add from 
people at Essex Museum, uh, but then there's a lot, lo a lot of um, logistic involved in securing a loan and also the insurance and everything. So uh, we wasn't able to include it um, to include everything we would like to include. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong, and for Dr. Williams. And um, I suppose not to make you pick favorites, but if there was one piece in this at uh, the exhibition that you would like everyone in this room to see, what would it be? I think um, it would be the Wu Bing Jian's portrait. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a um, very influential um, piece that talks about, kind of encapsulates the trade between U.S. and China. Wonderful. So the exhibition runs through February. So if you have not seen it, please um, visit us here at Rosecliff once again. And um, thank you, Dr. Huang. And if anyone has questions for Dr. Williams, um, since she's not here, we invite you to email us at museumaffairs at newportmansions.org. Again, that's museumaffairs at newportmansions.org. Um, and she will answer your questions there. And uh, our next lecture is coming up on November 9th here at Rosecliff or online. Um, it will wrap up our Celestial City lecture series, and it will have John N. Wong, who's a visiting scholar in American Studies at Brown University, and his topic is Exclusion, Rhode Island, and Kinship, Making Your Own Chinese Family. So he will explore how laws and social practices um, impacted Chinese family formation and reunif reunification um, and the Chinese Exclusion Act period and beyond. Um, so please join us back here for that. And we also have a reception outside, so we welcome you to join us on the terrace. Thank you again, Dr. Wong. Thank you.